Switching gears a little bit, for those of you who are in the Florida area or for anyone who is familiar with the citrus industry at all, you're no doubt aware of the devastating impacts of citrus greening disease. So before we head into our last speaker, who's one of the leading experts in this field, I'm going to show you a brief video to give you some context about the challenges that this threat is posing, and more importantly, some of the potential solutions that are out there um, thanks to plant breeding. So I will um, we'll tee up the video and then we'll head into our final speaker. A tree killing bacteria is wiping out the state's famous orange groves, 90% orange. I'm Fred Gemitter. I'm a citrus breeder and geneticist. I work at the University of Florida Citrus Research and Education Center in Lake Alfred, Florida. In the heart of citrus country with what scientists are doing to stop the disease. Agriculture and I think all humanity as a result faces some real serious challenges going forward. But there are some new technologies such as genome editing using CRISPR for example that allow us to attack some very specific targets, some very specific traits that are going to be important for the sustainable production of food into the future. Citrus greening is uh, for the citrus industry the worst possible nightmare imaginable. Um, it's a devastating disease. In Florida, for example, our production in the last 12 to 15 years has decreased by 75 to 80 percent. This disease is caused by a bacteria that lives within the plant, not on the plant. So there's not any way to spray any chemical to kill the bacteria. It's in the plant. It's moved by an insect that flies and feeds on the plant. So it spreads fairly rapidly. When a tree becomes infected, you begin to see some changes in the leaves. As the disease progresses, the tree declines. You see dieback. It produces fruit that are misshapen, that never become uh, very delicious. They don't develop the normal color, the normal flavor, everything has changed. And eventually the trees decline to the point where they're just not productive anymore. And it's, it's spreading throughout the world. It's moved throughout South America, throughout Central America. It's been in Asia, in China, and in India for more than 100 years. If we don't do something to solve the citrus greening problem, the decline in production is going to continue. Already many family farms in Florida have gone out of business. There are some packing houses for the fresh fruit industry that have been owned by families for three or four generations that have closed. But that way of life has supported 60, 70, 80,000 jobs in the state of Florida. So it's not just a handful of people who are suffering, but all the many people who work in businesses associated with this industry will be losing their jobs. We're on the cusp of seeing incredible breakthroughs using CRISPR genome editing methods to cure debilitating diseases in humans and animals. And we have the potential to do the same thing and more with plants. Basically what we're doing in this case is going into the DNA code, the sequence of the plants, and making very minor changes to the letters of the words in the, in the DNA code. So the idea here is that these are changes that are not drastic. It's simply working with the plant's own genome and making a small change. We're doing what it could normally do. Given enough time, citrus trees would develop resistance. They would evolve resistance to citrus greening. It might take hundreds of thousands of years. But if we can identify the gene that would make that difference, where that mutation could naturally occur and do it now, we, we've, we've accomplished something very important. Joining us to wrap up our program today and to give us his expert insight into the future of plant breeding is Dr. Fred Gemitter, who you just met in the video. Dr. Gemitter is a research foundation professor in citrus genetics at the University of Florida. Fred, I will turn it over to you. And Fred, if 
if you want to share your slides or we can pull them up from our end. Yep. I think that you're muted. Can you hear us, Fred? You're you're muted. Okay, there we, there go. we go. Okay. Sorry about that. I had some last minute internet issues and I've changed rooms. Hopefully for no the better. Worries. Are you able to show your slides or should we pull them up from our end? Let's try that right now. Let's see if we can do this. Looks like it's working. Okay, great. Okay, we're all ready. So first, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be here virtually today. Uh, yet another Zoom meeting in Zoom land. Um, you have, I think, had the opportunity to hear over the last two days an awful lot of information about plant breeding, plant breeding techniques. Um, so I think probably all of the, the people listening uh, could probably take an exam right now and, and describe how to create triploids or define BLUP and so on. Um, let's talk about gene editing and the future of plant breeding. And I should confess up front that I am a plant breeder. I work on citrus. So my personal bias is in uh, incorporating new techniques, new technologies into contemporary plant breeding schemes. Okay, looks like you have control of my slides. Sorry, uh, can we go to the next slide? There we go. So what I hope to speak about today to cover in, in the few minutes I have together with you is a very quick review of the science of breeding, to talk about GMOs and talk about this concept of gene editing or genome editing. This is most frequently done with a system referred to as CRISPR, and we'll talk about CRISPR, what it is, how it works, mention some of the applications of CRISPR uh, in plant improvement. Um, you've heard, you've seen the video about the disastrous impact of Huanglong Bing, HLB, citrus greening disease in Florida. We'll talk about some ideas about how CRISPR might be able to save our industry by creating resistant types. And then talk about some of the other possibilities that this new technology opens up to us and provide perspective on the future. So next, please. What is behind GMO, genetic engineering? In very simple terms, a gene is a, a piece of DNA that encodes a biological function. Uh, it's the sequence of the four letters, the four nucleotides of the gene and how they're organized that determine its function. And in plant genetic engineering, we modify the genome of plants to achieve desirable changes in traits. If we're talking about what we might consider now to be traditional GMO technology, we're actually inserting another gene from another organism into the genome of the plant in, with which we're working. Next, please. So GMO, genetically modified organism, contains foreign genes, genes that do not ordinarily exist in the plant in which we're working. It can come from any other organism. It can be derived synthetically, but it's something foreign uh, to the DNA of the plant. It's all based on historical discoveries of the DNA double helix in the 1950s and our ability to use recombinant DNA technology that developed in the 1970s. Currently, GMOs are very widespread in the world. GMO bacteria, GMO fungi, plants and animals are used in research and in industry. GM, GMO food um, is being accepted by the public slowly in some parts of the world very quickly. In other parts, there's an awful lot of resistance to it. Next. So let's compare GMO versus traditional plant breeding. Uh, the cartoons on the upper part of this slide uh, give an example of what happens when we make crosses, whether we do this in watermelons or peppers or citrus. Uh, there's a gene that exists in a donor variety, and it's a gene that's important 
to fix a problem in the recipient variety. And so we make the cross. And in so doing, those strings of marbles there are randomly mixed and assorted. And we can select the plant that has the new gene of interest. But when we do this, we also bring a lot of other genes and alleles with it. So we're not just introducing the one characteristic or the one trait. We're actually modifying multiple traits of the plant. If we look at genetic engineering, we can take that one simple desired gene, and that can come from another plant, it can come from a fish, it can come from any organism, and we insert that into the recipient variety. And so now we've just modified the original genome of the plant that we had with one new gene that confers a new trait, a new characteristic. Next, please. So in history, the first GMO crop was a tomato that was put up for sale commercially in 1994. It was a disaster, not because the technology wasn't working, but because they used a really poor quality tomato to do the transformation. Um, the tomato wasn't good even before the GMO uh, modification. Uh, since that time, though, we've learned an awful lot, and there are now GMOs of many, many stable crops, such as corn, cotton, soybean, canola, and the list goes on, papayas, zucchini, squash. Um, the release and planting of GMO crops over the last 20 years has increased quite rapidly. Next, please. GMO crops are grown in all of the nations that you see here colored in tan. Um, it's quite a bit of the civilized world, uh, the uh, developed world, we should say. Um, however, if you look in many of the other developing countries or you look into Europe, which is certainly a developed region, you'll see that GMOs are not widely embraced. There are many reasons why this is, and I'm not going to get into any of those here today. But the fact of the matter is GMOs are not embraced by all humanity. Next, please. This is a, a screenshot of someone who was talking about the problem of citrus greening and how GMOs may come to the rescue. There's been a lot of work done, actually, to create GMO citrus that can resist HLB. Um, but you can see this particular website uh, doesn't really think so. And if you read the bottom line there, it's in small print, it says, uh, so where are they getting these donors? Well, other kinds of trees, a couple of vegetables, a virus, and wait for it, pigs. And so there's all of this, this negative public perception that continues to persist. So GMOs, while they may work for us, perhaps we need another way to accomplish this. Next, please. All right, in this slide, the upper panel shows GMOs. And if that's not an option, what else do we have? Well, we look down below and we have traditional crossbreeding, which has been the way that humanity has improved crops for millennia. There is mutagenesis, and mutagenesis is a natural process that occurs in all living things. It can also be induced by treating plants with radiation, for example, to cause certain changes in the phenotype of those plants. And our third option is gene editing, and that's where we're going to talk today. Um, the word CRISPR has been widely circulated. No, we're good on CRISPR, please. Yeah, widely circulated in, in the public media. Everyone has heard of CRISPR. Uh, people have heard of CRISPR being used to modify the human germline. So it becomes a very contentious, uh, challenging technology in some sense from the PR point of view. But CRISPR at its best is really nothing more than taking advantage of some natural chemistry that can induce a mutation in a plant that is not any different from a mutation that might naturally occur given enough time and enough selection pressure. Next, please. CRISPR seems new, but it was first reported in 1987, at least the phenomena of, of bacteria producing enzymes to digest incoming virus attackers. It wasn't named until 15 years later in 2002 as CRISPR. Its role in immunity was defined in 2005. We learned about some of the different kinds of enzymes that can be used uh, 
the most common one used is Cas9, which cleaves, which cuts the DNA molecule. Uh, in 2012, we learned how to target that Cas9 to very specific regions of the genome. And this is the key uh, to the use of this technology. We're targeting something very, very specific. In 2013, the first reports of Cas9 editing in eukaryotic cells, including plants, came out. And in 2014, actually, the first paper was published on the use of CRISPR uh, in citrus, proof of concept that we could go into the citrus genome and edit genes. Next, please. So let's consider CRISPR first. How, how do we make GMO plants? Let's go back a little bit. Um, we make bullets of foreign DNA, and this can include these foreign genes or CRISPR, which in fact also is a foreign gene. Uh, we prepare the host so that they can absorb these foreign DNAs, and this is done in plants using agrobacterium transformation or biolistics, actually shooting small particles coated with the foreign DNAs into cells or directly by protoplast uptake, by removing the cell walls of plant cells enabling the plant, the, the foreign DNA to be taken up and incorporated. And that's followed, of course, by plant regeneration. We have to be able to regenerate from these cells that have been modified a whole plant. What is CRISPR? Well, it's clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, of course. Um, CRISPR is actually a piece of bacterial DNA that contains short repetitive sequences. And as I mentioned before, the bacteria use this as a defense mechanism to uh, digest, to chop up invading viruses. And we've learned that we can make this work in plants to make small changes at most places in the genome. Next, please. So what's required? First of all, we need a guide RNA. This is an RNA sequence that is complementary to a DNA sequence at the gene at which we wish to make modifications. So this RNA is capable of being introduced into the cell and it finds the complementary sequence on the DNA and it attaches. However, we also attach this Cas9 protein to the guide RNA, which you can see in the, the second panel there. And so we're now not only guiding the RNA to that spot, but that RNA has the enzyme that's capable next of clipping the DNA actually making a double-stranded break. And then the repair process is how things become changed. We can exert, insert foreign DNA, external DNA. Uh, we can knock out a handful of the nucleotides in that region so that that gene, uh, when it's transcribed, is no longer functional. Next, please. So there are many huge advantages of CRISPR. It's easy to design a change to almost any single gene in any genome, provided, of course, that we have the proper sequence of that gene so we can make the appropriate guide RNA molecule to find it in that nucleus. We also have the possibility of changing multiple genes. Many of the plant genes of interest that breeders manipulate actually are members of multi-gene families. And it may be necessary not only to attack one gene, but perhaps multiple members of the same family or other genes that are related to the same trait and characteristic um, that we want to use. Um, it's very precise. We have the option, if we do this properly, to leave no fingerprint behind after making the changes. And by that, I mean, I've mentioned that this is actually inserting foreign DNA, but if we do it in such a way that we can excise that foreign DNA, leaving behind only the native plant DNA with the changes, it's a clean operation with, with no fingerprint remaining. And so far, the US government and some other governments in the world have decided that if these changes are very small and if the machinery has been removed, that these plants will not be subject to the complicated regulation that's associated with GMOs, because there is really no introduction of foreign or bacterial DNA that's remaining as there is in GMO crops. Next, please. So this is a list of plants where CRISPR has been successfully used for creating herbicide resistance, disease resistance. Uh, many of these are, are proof of concept examples. Next, please. 
Our favorite white mushrooms have been edited by CRISPR. You know, if you cut white mushrooms and you let them sit out on the counter too long, the cut surfaces will become brown. This is caused by a very simple enzymatic reaction uh, by polyphenol oxidase. If we can turn off that gene that produces that enzyme in the mushroom, they won't they won't turn brown. And in fact, this has been done, and you can see the headline says that these mushrooms have escaped U.S. regulation. Actually, it's been a con conscious decision not to regulate such changes because they are extremely small and in fact, not much different than some mutation that could naturally occur given enough time. Next, please. Another example here of corn that's been edited uh, to modify this arch so it can be used for industrial purposes. Again, the plant has been modified. They can use um, the best hybrids that exist for producing these uh, compounds for industrial use. Uh, they retain the genotype and the phenotype, except there's this one small change that makes it uh, more suit. Next. I mentioned CRISPR has been proven to work in orange. The first paper was published by Dr. Nian Wong's lab at the CREC, University of Florida. Uh, and there's an awful lot of work going on these days uh, globally to use this technology to solve citrus problems. Next, please. I mentioned earlier that it's very important to be able to remove the machinery after the changes have been made to the DNA. And there's a paper published here in 2018. Uh, where we devised a method for not only producing, but for very effectively screening these modified plants with all the transgenic machinery removed. Again, only the native DNA exists with the changes of just a very few nucleotides. Next, please. Like all things, there are challenges and limitations. When we try to do uh, CRISPR work, we find that the transformation efficiency is much lower than the typical GMO plasmids that might be used. Uh, plant genomes can be much more complicated. Uh, some plants are, are polyploid, which means there are multiple copies of the gene of interest, and we may need to target multiple locations. Um, plant cells are surrounded by walls, and it makes it much more difficult to be able to insert the foreign DNA inside these cells. We have to optimize this protein, Cas9, for function in plants. Remember, it was something that evolved within bacteria and we need to make some changes. So in fact, it works more efficiently in plants. We want to minimize or eliminate all off-target effects uh, caused by this, this enzyme cleaving DNA. Potentially, it can go to closely related genes and cause some changes there as well. Uh, which underlines the importance of having good genome sequence. For the business of getting HLB resistance, however, the, one of the greatest challenges is identifying what are the relevant targets for HLB resistance. And I'll speak to that in just a moment. All these limitations, however, this tool is enabling very precise, potentially unregulated changes to the citrus genome or any other plants, allowing trait targeted modifications. Next, please. Next slide. This is a very complicated slide that I don't want to explain. I want you to look at it and realize this is very complicated because this is a, a map of all of the potential cellular, biochemical, and molecular interactions that would take place when that C. liberobacter, that's the bacterium that causes greening in the upper left-hand corner, when that interacts or enters into the citrus cell, a number of things are involved in the host pathogen interaction. It's not a very simple process, so it's not easy to identify a single gene that we can attack with this technology. Next, please. So researchers in Florida and California and really around the world have been targeting a number of different genes that we find from other studies that are potential targets for HLB resistance. Uh, it may very well be that we need to target more than one. Uh, in the history of plant breeding, single gene resistance to diseases almost always breaks down very quickly. So to have long-term durable resistance to this disease, it's very likely that we need to hit a number of different targets. Next, please. 
On the left hand side, you can see a number of approaches for how we might be able to do some of this. Um, we can, for example, use CRISPR to go in and change a resistance gene from one that's not so resistant to one that is very resistant. Alternatively, in the second line there, you can see a, a string of susceptibility genes. These are genes that interact with something from the pathogen that stimulates or causes the cascade of events that leads to the disease syndrome. If we can take out these receptors, the plant can't develop disease. Um, we can go ahead and modify the promoter. We can modify structural uh, parts of genes. So there are a number of different strategies now that we have in hand where we can use these molecular CRISPR scissors to go in, cut DNA and make changes. Next, please. I mentioned earlier that what we're doing is really not much different than naturally occurring mutations. Um, this is a classic example in citrus. The first grapefruit known to humankind was white-fleshed and had about 50 seeds per fruit. It was introduced into the U.S. in 1823. If you go to the market today, however, you can buy these seedless, beautifully colored, deep red grapefruit on the right-hand side. This is the result of a series of mutations that's taken place over the last in this case, the last 150 years to get us to 1970. That red color is lycopene, the same pigment that you saw in those beautiful watermelons a few minutes ago. And lycopene is produced in the carotenoid biosynthetic pathway. It's an intermediate. There is an enzyme called lycopene cyclase that digests or changes lycopene into beta carotene. What happened in grapefruit that made it go from white flesh to red is that lycopene cyclase no longer functions, a naturally occurring mutation. Now, potentially, we could take a white grapefruit and using CRISPR go in and debilitate the gene that produces the enzyme that causes this reaction. And we could, by CRISPR, produce a red grapefruit from a white in a very short period of time, certainly much less than 150 years. Next, please. So talking about grapefruit, there's an issue that's known as the grapefruit juice effect. And quite simply, this is the result of some chemicals that exist inside of grapefruit that are called foranocoumarins. The foranocoumarins interact with enzymes in the human gut that are involved with the metabolism of drugs that we take. Foranocoumarins knock out the function of our enzymes. So when we're taking statins or we're taking blood pressure medications, instead of the normal amount of metabolism that would take place, the metabolism is knocked out and the amount of drug that you actually find in the blood is much higher than in the absence of grapefruit juice, leading to potentially risky situations. What can we do about this? Next slide, please. This is a selection that we released. It's called UF914. It's a grapefruit hybrid. It was made by not by CRISPR, but by breeding. And it's very, very low in foranocoumarin while retaining all of the characteristics, the color, the flavor, and the aroma of grapefruit. Next slide, please. When we tested the foranocoumarin content of UF914, uh, there are three members of the foranocoumarin family listed here, Paradisin C, 6,7-DHB, and Bergamotin. And we compared 914 with the Hudson grapefruit we saw that the most bioactive of all of these foranocoumarins, paradisin C, was not detected at all in 914. And if you look at the second and third most bioactive, you can see dramatic, dramatic reductions in the amount of foranocoumarin. So potentially this is a variety that might avoid the juice, the grapefruit juice effect. Next, please. 914 originated as a triploid, you heard something about seedless watermelons. We perform the same sort of crosses, a diploid low acid pomelo crossed with pollen from a tetraploid ruby red. We used embryo rescue to recover the embryo that grew to be the tree that's known as UF914. The cross was made in 2002 and we released the variety actually quite quickly in 2012, 10 years. Or potentially, 
had we had CRISPR technology in 2002, we might have been able to simply use it to go in and modify the gene or genes that are responsible for anocumarins in true grapefruit. Next, please. So I hope you can see that CRISPR is a very powerful tool, but it's a tool, it's not an end all. Traditional breeding likewise is very powerful and traditional breeding, we might now consider contemporary breeding because we have a lot of new technologies, new approaches, uh, including genome selection, genome prediction and so on that modern plant breeders are using. CRISPR is most powerful when it's being used to influence a trait for which there is little or no genetic variation. So what happened with our 914? Well, we did some consumer surveys. We found consumers who loved grapefruit and hated grapefruit. We talked to them about the grapefruit juice effect and the potential of removing that from, from the grapefruit world. Uh, both the lovers and haters of grapefruit were really interested in this possibility. But what surprised us was that the non-grapefruit consumers were very much surprised by the sweetness of UF914. So not only was it lower in foranocoumarins, but it also had improved sweetness. The sugars were higher, the acidity was lower. Um, and as a result, we came to realize that there were actually many other things that had been affected as the result of our crossing. So the point here is that for plant breeding, for cultivar development and improvement, most commonly breeders are not looking at a single target as we are perhaps in the case of HLB resistance. But we're looking at multiple targets, multiple traits, multiple characteristics that all need to be folded into the decisions breeders make as we move forward to commercialize new cultivars. CRISPR doesn't replace breeding science, it's supportive of breeding science. Next, please. What do we need to use CRISPR successfully? First of all, we need to understand the genetic mechanisms that are underlying the trait of interest. We need to have genes that we can target. We need, and this is very critical, a high quality genome sequence assembly, one that's fully annotated. CRISPR is only as good as the quality of the genome sequence that exists because we're reliant on highly accurate genome sequence to create the guide RNA that we need to get CRISPR machinery to the exact gene that we wish to target. That's critical. We need to have effective uh, methods to introduce CRISPR into the machines and we need into the cells and we need to be able to make plants. Uh, we need to have the ability to make homozygous mutations uh, because many of the genes that we're attacking are heterozygous. And if we knock out one copy, the other copy still may function and we may not see the result we want to see. We need methods to create edits in multiple genes. Very importantly, again, we need the ability to remove all traces of the CRISPR machinery. And breeding programs globally are integrating this technology within their cultivar development programs. Success means that the end product contains only the host genome DNA. Expressing a mutation, that is no different than one might occur, one that might occur naturally given enough time. Next, please. That's my last slide. I'll leave you a photo of some of the beautiful fruit genetic diversity within citrus. I thank you for your time and attention. I thank Asta for the invitation to come and speak today. And I'm ready for whatever questions we may have. Thank you. Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, thank you so much for the great presentation. We have we have some really good questions here in the chat. Um, some about citrus greening and some about gene editing. So I think I'll just start off here. How close are we for finding a solution to citrus greening? That's always the most difficult question. Um, we we learn a lot more every day that goes by. There are labs all around the world looking at different kinds of solutions for citrus greening. Uh, very recently, there's been some talk about a peptide that's produced by a, a kind of citrus called microcitrus that seems to be able to kill the bacteria. Um, it's being tested right now. And if this turns out to be reality, uh, we may have a solution within the next two years. 
Researchers have been working with a number of these peptides over the past 15 years, however, and some of them that look good in the beginning uh, eventually fail. So we don't know that that's the case. We will continue to look for genetic resistance uh, to citrus greening. Um, we have developed tolerant types. There are some citrus rootstocks that uh, allow the trees to grow in a more healthy condition, even when infected with the bacteria. We have some cyan varieties that are also more tolerant of HLB, but we're really looking for these knockout punches, something that we can put into the plant that will make them uh, immune to the disease. And once we find such genes, we have to validate, verify. And then of course, there must come a period of time where we're going to test these trees in the field for a number of years because citrus trees, unlike watermelon and pepper, are in the ground for decades, not for a couple of weeks. And so we need to have something that really is robust and long-term. Thank you. So going along with that, how, how far in the future do you think it could be that you could have the option of, of using gene editing um, and then just in general, you know, how far away are we from commercialization? What are some of those challenges, um, you know, that, that stand in the way? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's very likely we're going to find a gene editing solution within the next two to three years. Um, that sounds like a long time, but citrus trees are difficult to work with. It's, it's a long process. The bottlenecks are once we find something and we test it in the lab and then we test it in the greenhouse, again, we have to go to the field and do some long-term field testing to confirm that it's, it's going to, to be durable, to confirm that we haven't created any other changes in the performance of the plant that might be deleterious. And assuming all that goes as quickly as possible, um, we then need to look at ramping up the supply of plant material because we're not collecting citrus seeds and planting them in the field and seeing a tree in six weeks later, like we would with a vegetable crop. Citrus trees are propagated vegetatively. We need to uh, increase the supply of budwoods. We need to have budwood source trees that are going to provide millions of buds to be placed in nurseries and the nursery takes a year to grow the tree and then that tree goes to the field and takes two years before it has fruit. So this is a long, long haul for us in the world of citrus. Yeah, yeah it sounds like we need all the tools that we can get. So how are you ensuring that products produced from gene editing are safe? That's a very good question. Um, one of the ways to ensure safety uh, is to make absolutely certain that all of the GMO machinery has been removed because these are some of the, the issues uh, with GMO crop plants that are, are a concern. There are antibiotic resistance genes and so on. But in most cases, what we're doing with CRISPR is actually, we might say even safer than typical traditional crossbreeding because we're affecting one single gene or a small handful, a small number of genes, all of the rest of the genome, all the rest of the genes in the plant are still being expressed in the normal fashion. If we make a cross between different kinds of peanuts, for example, um, we don't know, we're, we're bringing in hundreds and hundreds of different alleles for different genes. And we don't ever actually go ahead and test those plants to see you know, are, are these plants actually safe? We don't, we don't even think about it, but potentially there could be allergens that we're not aware of. So, you know, one of the beauties of this system is that again, we're affecting a, a targeted single gene. Thank you. Okay, a few, some technical questions here. How successful have you been in identifying resistance genes within the citrus germplasm library? And is this typically just one gene or multiple genes? We've been very successful in identifying a laundry list of several hundred genes. Uh, but a laundry list is just that. Um, and so the challenge becomes, as I showed in, in the one slide, the complex interaction of the pathogen and the host cell. There are many, many things that take place, many things that occur. 
And so we've got to narrow down our laundry list. And, and we have done that over the years by different sorts of projects to validate whether or not some of the targets that we find are, are critical. I don't think there's going to be one single gene that's going to be the solution. I think we're going to have to look at multi-gene targets. Again, just looking at classical breeding for resistance to wheat rust or any of the other you know, pathogens in any plant you want to name, you know, we find a single gene for resistance and the bacteria or the fungi or whatever the pathogen is, they're, they're very good at mutating and getting around that resistance quite quickly. And so a single gene would not be a good strategy, especially for a perennial, a woody perennial plant like a citrus tree. Thank you. Okay, on the topic of climate change, climate change is a major concern right now. Could gene editing play a role on combating climate change? I think maybe if you could speak to, I would say combating and then also um, helping, you know, mitigate the impacts, but also helping crops withstand um, changing temperatures. Yeah, looking looking outside of citrus, sometimes I get stuck in my citrus world. Um, looking outside of citrus, there are already a number of projects, uh, a number of papers that have been published, for example, um, where researchers have used CRISPR to go in and modify genes that are associated with stress tolerance in general. It could be high temperature tolerance, uh, it could be drought tolerance, um, and many times drought and high temperature, these are controlled by very similar pathways. And so people are, in fact, looking at, at doing these kinds of things right now. There's been some work um, involved with looking at how we can sequester more carbon out of the atmosphere into the roots of plants. And so people are working on plants now that have the ability to sequester carbon into their roots at much higher rates and to grow deeper roots that would leave that carbon sequestered in the soil. So there are a lot of different ways that this technology uh, is being used to address climate change. Great, thank you. Um, do countries that don't allow GMOs instead allow CRISPR? That is, is CRISPR more widely accepted than GMOs? Are you able to speak to that? Yes, um, the, the answer, the simple answer is, is yes, but it's not universal. Um, certain countries that have not embraced GMO technology are allowing CRISPR technology to go forward. They're importing uh, products that have been modified by CRISPR. Uh, if we look at our friends across the Atlantic Ocean in the EU, however, um, the, the EU community has decided that CRISPR plants uh, are no different than GMO plants. And so currently they're being regulated in the EU. Um, there's a lot of pushback on that because the reality is a CRISPR edited plant is substantially different from a GMO plant. Yes, the reality is we use GMO technology to get CRISPR into the plant to make the modifications. But again, there are some very clever ways to excise that machinery. And in the whole plants in the end, um, there's nothing left except the native DNA if we do this process properly. And those mutations, again, are not different than mutations that occur naturally all the time. Thank you. You've stated that you need to remove the CRISPR machinery. Is this basically extra gene material? What happens if it is left in the cell? Um, the machinery is, is actually excised. There are a number of, of different ways people do this. In, in annual crops, for example, you can use CRISPR and you can go in and make the change in the nucleotide. And it, it's, CRISPR is in there in a heterozygous condition. So you can self those plants and 50% of the next generation will not have the machinery inside the cell. It will have the modified DNA but not the machinery. We can't do that with citrus trees because we can't self citrus trees. Um, so we have to have other, other approaches and we have developed approaches that allow this, these changes to take place within the cells. And then as we regenerate the plants, that machinery is, is removed. It's no longer present, not only in the nucleus, it's not in the cells, it's gone, it's undetectable. You can't find it, it's because it's not there. 
Thanks. Okay, well, we're, I think we've gotten to the bottom of the questions, but people may be still typing. So um, while we're waiting to see if there are any more questions, I just want to ask you from your perspective, what do you see um, as some of the biggest challenges other than um, citrus greening? What are some of the biggest challenges that you're looking at over the next five or 10 years? And how are you working to solve those? What makes you excited about plant breeding right now? <laughs> Why do I still go to work every day? That's the question. <laughs> uh, you know, before we had citrus greening in Florida, we had a large number of problems that we were working through traditional breeding to get solutions. There are a lot of other diseases that have not gone away because of, of the presence of citrus greening. They've just been overshadowed. Um, we've always been interested in improving the quality of citrus products. Um, we want consumers, um, you know, to look at a citrus fruit, to taste it and feel compelled to go back and get another one. We, we want citrus addicts and there's an awful lot that we can do to uh, improve the quality of fresh citrus fruit as well as the quality of the juice. Um, and we're, we're looking at all sorts of breeding approaches to do that. CRISPR is another tool we have in our toolbox to accomplish that. Great. Thanks. Um, I wish we could all be in, in person with you and sampling some of the citrus right now, maybe next year. Um, I do have another question that came in. Could gene editing completely replace the need for GMOs? I seem to have lost my sound. Oh, we can hear you. Oh, can you not hear me? Can you see the chat box? Okay. Well, if we don't if we don't get Fred back, um, we are we are running towards the end of our of our program, regardless. Um, but I want to thank you all for being here. If if Fred did not get to answer one of your questions, please feel free to continue typing those in the chat box. You can also email them to me, and I'll be happy to um, follow up with him and get any questions to you that he may not have had a chance to answer. But thanks for great questions and a great discussion. Um, and we just really appreciate you joining us over these last two days. We hope you found it valuable, gained some new insight into plant breeding innovation and what's um, happening um, for our future. Um, please continue to use us as a resource and feel free to follow up with any questions um, or requests. Um, we're always here to help. My contact information is here on the screen. So again, thank you for spending this time with us and we look forward to staying in touch. Have a great rest of the day.